Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone to this edition of Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce Jos Peter Katun, uh, who is an authority in, um, uh, in verific formal verification, particularly in, in probabilities and stochastic systems. And he will be exactly talking about that topic today. So he'll be talking about synthesizing probabilistic programs. Jos Peter, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. By the way, we are recording this meeting and it will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear on the YouTube uh, recording, you can uh, join as a guest, turn off your camera and it should be fine. Jos Peter, thanks again for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, thanks a lot to the audience for being here. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, today is about synthesis. And I want basically to talk to start off with parameter synthesis, and then I want to talk about uh, synthesizing the structure, uh, basically of probabilistic programs. But you can see probabilistic programs as representations. I mean, as some kind of syntactical representations of probabilistic models. Um, this is joint work with Milan Cieska and uh, Roman Andrioshenko from uh, Brno University of Technology, and Sebastian Junges. He formerly was in Aachen. And then was in Berkeley. Actually, he recently moved to, to Nijmegen. I should update this picture a bit in, in, in Nijmegen. Um, so I would like to start with parameter synthesis, and I do this by means of an example. Um, so my whole talk, I try to, to keep everything at the intuitive level as far as I can. So I refrain from giving formal definitions and so on. Um, I just want to convey basically the main intuition, right? So there are many randomized algorithms, and they, they're based on, on coin flipping. And it turns out that sometimes it's very important to know whether the coin flip is fair or whether the, there is a certain bias. And then the question is, uh, can we automatically synthesize the optimal bias? And the way I'm going to introduce you this is by means of looking at uh, self-stabilization, which is, a, uh, I would say, a very well-established notion in distributed fault-tolerant distributed computing. So it's all about a distributed system. Uh, think about different nodes. These nodes can fail, they communicate uh, certain values to each other. And then the idea is that this algorithm that is running on this uh, distributed system is called self-stabilizing. If it converges, what does that mean? You start from an arbitrary state, but then it converges to a certain what they call legitimate state. Think about a token ring network. You might have a temporary uh, situation where there are multiple tokens. A legitimate state is when there is only a single token. And then they also uh, preserve what is called closure. And that means basically the system remains in a le legitimate state in absence of any faults. So if no node is going to fail, if no communication is failing, then if the system has a single token, the single will remain having a single token. And that's nice because those algorithms work correctly for every initialization and they can recover from the transient faults, right? Because of the first property, if there has a transient fault, you get back to an arbitrary state, but then it will automatically converge again to a legitimate state. So um, there's a famous paper by Dijkstra in the 80s and says that uh, self-stabilization in anonymous networks is impossible. So let me try to explain what that means. Now, an anonymous network means you're looking for an algorithm that is not using the identity of the nodes in the network. Basically, you want an algorithm, a distributed algorithm that is the same for all the nodes. No? And it's impossible, you should interpret that there is no deterministic solution to solving self-stabilization in an anonymous network. And actually, Dijkstra proposed a solution, but that's not anonymous. It used a specific process called the leader that's solving the self-stabilization. And then in the 90s, uh, Ted Herman came up well, I can use this, I can solve this, I will use randomization. And that's the algorithm I'm going to explain in a minute. So this is the distributed system we are considering. It's a ring of, of processes. These are the circles in my picture. Um, and we have an odd number of those rings, and it's a unidirectional ring. Let's suppose you can only send messages in a clockwise manner, okay? Every process has a Boolean variable. In my picture, these are colored. So you think about green as being zero and red being one or vice versa. And then uh, processes have access to the neighbor's value. So process one, for instance, has access to the, the value of its left neighbor, which is zero. And then there is a special token, which is those black fat dots in the, in the processes. And actually the, the principle is a process has a token 
if it has the same color as its left neighbor. So you see seven has a token because six is also green, five has a token because its left neighbor four is also red and so forth. Good, so that's the principle. So we only have values which are bits and you can uh, have access to the value of your left neighbor. And now what is the algorithm of Hermann? This is this two line algorithm. So it's for an anonymous network. So you're not using your identity, right? So every process does the same. And it does basically the following. If your value xi is the same as the one of your left neighbor xi minus one, then you flip a biased coin. And based on the outcome, you set your own variable to zero or to one. If, however, you have a different color than your neighbor, then you're going to copy the color of your neighbor. Xi becomes Xi minus one. And then there is the principle that I just explained. A process possesses a token if Xi equals Xi minus one, which means if your left neighbor has the same color as your, as your own color. And now we're interested in what is uh, basically the expected number of steps that this system will reach a legitimate state. So we'll stabilize. And stabilize here means there is a single token in the whole network. So just to, for, your, uh, um, for your understanding, here is a simple uh, run of the algorithm. So we start in the picture on the, on the left top. And you see there are three tokens at five, seven, and process one. And now uh, the first thing that happens, uh, so basically I do the separate steps uh, uh, separately here. Uh, we first go to the picture on the, the right top. Uh, and that happens basically by uh, flipping the value of every node that has a different color than yourself. So for instance, process number eight in the left is red because its left neighbor is green. Now um, the, pro the, the protocol says uh, you should copy the color of your neighbor. So what you see is that eight becomes green. Similarly, two becomes green and you see that four becomes green and six for instance becomes red. Yeah, good. Now what happens is that all the processes that have a token, they're going to flip this biased coin. So this applies to number one, to number five, and to number seven. So now we go to the picture in, at the bottom left. And apparently we flip the coin. Uh, one, uh, the, flip the coin, but the value stays the same because it stays green. Seven also flipped the coin, but apparently the value of the coin flip was such that the value is changed from red from green to red. And for five, nothing changes. And then what we have to do, you have to assign the tokens new. So what you see now is that that happens in the picture on the right uh, bottom is that now given the whole color scheme, we have to reschedule the tokens, so to speak, or redistribute the tokens. And now what you see is that for instance, five uh, gets its token deleted because its left neighbor four has a different color. But six will get a token because its left neighbor now has the same color and so forth. So this is basically one step of the algorithm done by all the processes synchronously. And what you see is that nothing has gained because in the initial scenario, we had three tokens. In now the scenario that we get, we still have three tokens. So if you can do another step, and I won't go through the details here, you can already imagine that depending on the coin flips outcomes, it might be the case that you end up with a scenario with a single token. And indeed, this is the case if you look at the picture on the, uh, the bottom right. So the question is, what's the expected number of steps until this, uh, let's say, algorithm, let's say, gets to a single token? And um, that's what you can synthesize automatically. So um, in the past, we developed uh, a couple of algorithms that allows you to automatically synthesize the optimal bias. And here you see the bias on the x-axis of the picture, and you see the expected recovery time or the expected time until reaching a single token on the y-axis. And the different colored, uh, let's say, uh, plots are for different sizes of the ring. And the interesting phenomenon that appears is that if the ring is small, uh, a, a fair coin is optimal. And that's exactly what you see if P is a half for this blue and this, what is it, a brown curve, you see you have a single minimum, which is exactly at the half. But if the ring size increases, and that basically means that in terms of the plots, you go up in the picture, you see that you get two minima, and those minima are getting further and further away. So what you get basically is that for larger rings, more bias reduces this recovery time. 
And the interesting thing is that you do not obtain this by, let's say, model checking single instances. No, you really synthesize these values automatically. And um, here are some numbers in terms of the amount of time that you need, and you also get some idea about the size of the system. So in the column, the leftmost column, you see the size of the ring, which is odd. Then you see the number of states in terms of a probabilistic model, and think about this as a Markov chain. So about half a million states, and what is it, more than one million states in the case of a ring of size 19. And then you see the synthesized values of the bias, which is the, blue, the first blue column P, and then the expected uh, convergence time, which is the one but last column on the right. And then the time in seconds, that's the rightmost column that tells you how much time it took us to synthesize these values. So this is not solving a model checking problem, right? If you solve a synthesis problem, namely, basically, what is the optimal value for a specific uh, property? In this case, uh, expected number of steps until convergence. Good. I'm going to, to skip this slide. This is saying a bit on how we're how we doing this. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I want to basically uh, uh, say the following. The state of the art at the moment is that you can automatically synthesize the parameter values, the parameter values of the probabilities for a given property. Uh, and in my case, this example was minimizing the expected convergence time. So this, I think, is already, let's say, a step from solving a model checking problem to trying to solve, uh, uh, in this case, a parameter synthesis problem. But in this talk, I basically want to even go one step further. I want to even uh, synthesize also topologies. So the, actually, the problem that we have seen so far is an instance of the following. This is a discrete time Markov chain, right? It based, is basically flipping a fair coin in every state. And at some point, you get an outcome of one, two, six. And actually, this is an algorithm by Knut uh, and Yao from the 70s that uh, mimics a six-sided uh, die by means of a fair coin, by flipping repeatedly a fair coin. So here you answer the question, for instance, what is the, the probability to reach outcome two is one over six. And you maybe want to know what is the expected number of times I want to flip the fair coin until I get the outcome two. What I just have shown you um, uh, in terms of the parameters, where I only had a one parameter p, in a sense, I, you can look at the picture on the right, where you basically see uh, the same picture on, as on the left, apart from the fact that now I replace this a half by x and one minus x. So think about this again as a biased coin. So we have a single biased coin. I don't know what is the bias, hmm, x, one minus x. And now what you're interested in is not what is the probability to reach to, but you're interested, for instance, interested in for which values of x is the probability to reach to in a certain range, let's say close to a half. Yeah? And the way to solve that, for instance, is that you uh, can show that uh, this probability actually is a rational function. Uh, in this example, this is given by uh, the rational function indicated uh, at the bottom uh, right. And then basically, you can reduce this to a kind of uh, SMT uh, uh, query, uh, uh, for which does there exist an X for which uh, the solution to this rational function lies in this interval, which is uh, closely around a half. Now, what is typically assumed is that uh, the cases that x equals zero and x equals one are excluded. And it's, it's clear from the picture why we probably do that, because if you would exclude the case x equals zero, you will see that the left part of my uh, Markov chain, starting from state S1, is not reachable because I would eliminate this edge, right? So in parameter synthesis, um, and people call this graph preserving, you don't allow to change the topology, but what you do allow is to change, to tune the parameters. And what I want to show you a bit today is uh, what can we still do if you also allow topology changes or if you just allow topology changes, right? And you can view this as not changing not tweaking the parameters, but I want to tweak and to change the control structure. Yeah? And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to argue that this has many applications, um, for instance, in software product lines, but also in terms of controller synthesis. And we will see some of those examples. I must say this is all, let's say, work that we started about two, three years ago. I think there still has a lot to be done. 
And my aim in this talk is basically to show you uh, where we are at the moment, but in particular, hopefully to convince you from the fact that, um, that this is interesting also for, uh, for different kinds of synthesis problems. Yes, Peter, do you mind if I ask a question? No, no sure, sure. Please go ahead. So the property with respect to which, which you are synthesizing those parameters, uh, is, it's not clear to me what kind of properties you're using here. Because, uh, for example, in the, in the case of the, uh, the six-phase die, you're using reachability. In the, yep. in, the, in the case of that ring, you're, you seem to have a more complex type of property, or...? Um, it, it, there I use what is called an expected reward property, uh, which is basically a, a, a slight generalization of a probabilistic reachability. Yeah. So in my talk, I will basically focus on probabilistic reachability, or what they call expected rewards. I'm not going to introduce a full-fledged logic to do that. Uh, so basically, we synthesize for, for reachability probabilities. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so instead of, uh, let's say, having my picture on, on the left, I now can also allow topology changes, which means that I redirect the edge from S3 to S2 now to S1, for instance, right? Or from X6 to S1. And then uh, actually you can view this as, uh, as a family of Markov chains. I mean, very abstractly in this picture, uh, every dot is a Markov chain. And what I'm considering is actually a family of Markov chains. And um, inside the family, I allow various topology changes, but only finitely many. So in a sense, I'm considering finite sets of finite Markov chains. And I want to stress the difference with the parameter synthesis problem that I showed you before. Parameters can have real values. So there I was considering actually infinite, set, I mean, even uncountable sets of finite Markov chains. Yeah. So there is a difference here. Um, so we're looking at the following things. We are input is a Markov chain family, and I will make clear what I mean by this, and a certain property. And Mohammed, indeed, this is a, a reachability probability, property. So can a certain set of states, let's say G, the good states, be reached with a probability larger than P or at most P? And P is a constant here, okay? P is a constant, G is given, uh, and the Markov chain family is given, okay? But it can be huge. And now you can synthesize, try to synthesize various goals. For instance, I want to find one member in the family and I will call this member a realization. And what is a realization here? It's a concrete Markov chain. Right? And I want to find at least one that satisfies my property, if, that, if it exists. Or um, maybe I want to find all realizations satisfying F. So what does that mean? I want to partition my family into the good and the bad instances, those that satisfy my specification and those that do not. Yeah? And you can even realize that, uh, think about what is the realization with the maximal probability to reach G, or the minimal, if that is your interest. So you can even look at some yeah, optimization. So there are different synthesis goals, and you can even think about adding costs. Uh, it might be the case that a certain instance, if there are many arrows, every arrow can have a cost that you maybe are interested in finding the cheapest realization satisfying the property if it exists, or I give you a budget uh, about what is the costs, the total cost that you can spend. And I want, I'm interested in find all realizations within the budget that satisfy this property. So there are different variants of the kind of goals. And um, these are the kind of synthesis questions that we are interested in. Good. So let me explain you what is a family. So here I have a family of, um, what is it, six times three. So I have 18 family members, and they're graphically depicted on the right. So what do I mean by this? I mean, for instance, if I look at the leftmost state, you see that it has uh, six possible direct successors. Um, and it means that one of these edges is present. Okay, so I have a choice between one of these uh, six, six edges. So for instance, this is one member in the family. Yeah, this is one specific in instantiation of the model that I'm considering. This is, for instance, another one where apparently the choice of the two red arrows have changed. Yeah, uh, this would be another family member, uh, and so forth. So the total family, uh, let's say, is represented by this uh, abstract picture picture on the right. 
So what's the objective? The objective is to partition the parameter space. So for instance, I want to partition into the instances of the family. And here I look at a smaller set, set that satisfies my specification, the green instances, and the one that violate my specification, the red instances. So the baseline approach is you fix the parameters, you build the model, and you model check. So how does this work? Suppose I have uh, these instances. I take the first instance. Suppose that this is my model. This is just a Markov chain. Yeah. So I discharge this Markov chain to a probabilistic model checker like Prism. And that model checker tells me, no, 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 it does not satisfy my property. And then, of course, I can look at the second instance. Maybe this is this instance. Uh, I can do this uh, again and check uh, my property. Yeah. Or I can check uh, this one or I can check that one, and so forth. Now, this is the baseline. And this, of course, very simple, but it does not use any of the structure from the family. And of course, you understand if my family is large, and we talk about uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of family members, this is not going to work. So there has been an approach proposed by, uh, by some people working on, on, on product lines that they, I call this the all-in-one approach. So let me try to explain uh, what that mean, means. So here I have the, uh, let's say, suppose I do this only for four instantiations for simplicity. So their idea was the following. Why don't we represent those four ones by a single representation where we add one extra new state? And that new state models a kind of a non-deterministic choice. And there, basically, initially, you select which family member, which realization you're going to pick. And um, so initially, you just resolve a non-deterministic choice, and you decide which instance you have. And in fact, yeah, this is a single representation of all possible family members. Now, this you can do it, exploit some regularity with symbolic methods, because you can exploit some symmetry between the family members that are quite similar. Um, but the model checking is a bit slow already on, uh, let's, I would say, moderate family sizes. So that's not very scalable, I would say. So one idea that you can also take is to use abstraction. So what do I mean by this? Again, I take the same four instances. And by means of abstraction, I'm going to make one model out of it. Yeah, so this was indeed my abstract version of the representation I used initially. And what does it intuitively mean? And that's at the top of the slide. You basically forget in which realization you are. Yeah? You have a very abstract figure here. You have non-deterministic choices all over the places. Yeah? Initially, between all possible yellow outgoing arrows, but also in the two states with the red outgoing arrows, you have a non-deterministic choice which of the outgoing arrows you're going to, to take uh, in the concrete instantiation. And this yields what we call a quotient Markov decision process. It's no longer a Markov chain you know, because of the non-determinism that is added. But the non-determinism is added only by the abstraction, right? It was not present in the original model. It's purely introduced by doing the abstraction. And now what you can do is you can do, apply model checking to this quotient Markov decision process and use the results to try to solve the partitioning problem. And the idea is to use yeah, a procedure which is called counterexample guided abstraction refinement. So this is the picture, and I'm going to explain this by means of an example. So we start at the top with a family, and the family is uh, basically uh, the input to the whole problem. And remember, I want to check, for instance, is there a realization in the family satisfying the property? And my property here is phi. Now, the first thing we do is we abstract this. So that's the quotient. I showed you on the previous slide. Now, in a, in a sense, actually, we will see that during the algorithm, we will not have to treat one quotient, but we have several. So therefore, you see that there is a set of quotients in the middle of my picture. And now what you do is you pick one of the quotients. And that's a Markov decision process, right? Because the quotient in, has non-determinism. But it's a concrete MDP with fixed values, with fixed probabilities. So you can discharge this to a model checker like Prism or Storm, and you verify this. And now you get back a probability plus perhaps a counterexample, and you check, is my property satisfied? If that's the case, you have found a feasible realization and you're, you've solved your problem. 
If this is not the case, yeah, then you maybe have to pick another alternative. So then you go back to the set of quotients and try the next one. And if the answer is inconclusive, then actually you have to refine the quotient. And this refinement actually gives rise to the fact that I don't have a single quotient, the one that I started with, but I'm going to have basically sub, uh, uh, I'm going to split the family into subfamilies. And if in the end, the whole set of quotients is empty and I was not able to find any satisfying instance, then unfortunately I have to conclude that my problem is unsatisfiable. And actually there is no instance that satisfies my property. And so one way to view this is, is what you see here. So here I have an, an instant, basically 25 instances, two parameters. In pick, figure A, all uh, instances are inconclusive. And now what you try to do is, so you, you, you pick the whole abstract MDP that represents all the 25 instances in picture A. The MDP model checker says, ah, I'm inconclusive. And now we're going to split the family. So one possible split you see in picture B is that, for instance, we take the 10 instances in the left two columns, and that's represented again by an MDP. We discharge this to a model checker, and the model checker gives us information. No, 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 no. None of the members in that subfamily will satisfy your property. And then what you try to do is you try to uh, basically refine. So then we take um, in picture C, you see the 15 dark blue ones. Again, you check it, it's inconclusive. Then in picture D, you, take, you check the six in the rightmost box, and apparently there, um, this family is satisfying the, the, the specification. So there we have find a realization. So it's a kind of a top-down approach. You start by representing the whole family, and you try to split it until in the end, you hopefully get a subfamily that satisfies the property that you are interested in. I hope this principle is clear. Um, let me try to, uh, to, to, an to analyze this uh, thing. So this is the way to view this. So you take an instance, yeah? that gives you a reachability probability. Another instance of the family will give you another reachability probability. This one will you give you another one. So in a sense, if you would check the whole family, you would get all the dots. That's of course not what you want because that would be the baseline. So you check the whole family. Yeah? And what is the whole family giving? This is a Markov decision process. If you model check this, you get an upper bound and a lower bound. So you get a minimum and a maximal probability, a minimal reachability probability and a maximal. Think about this as a game. You want to reach in my picture, the, the final state, the double circle state. And now there are basically, uh, there is a, pay, a player which is cooperative that helps you to increase the probability, to maximize the probability to reach this target state that will give you rise to the to the rightmost, uh, let's say, uh, so the upper bound. And you can also get a lower bound, namely uh, if you play against uh, an environment that tries to keep you away from the, from the final state. And that will give you the lower bound. And if there, there is the threshold, uh, then uh, what you try to do is you basically uh, try to uh, in infer. So here is this uh, done uh, in abstract. So suppose this is my family on the left. This is this red. Uh, this is this blue rectangle, and I will give you two columns. One is giving the full situation, the situation which is not visible to the algorithm but only visible to us, and then I will give you what is the algorithm's perspective. So suppose this is the full situation. All family members. Again, we have a lower bound and an upper bound. You see the threshold, the black, uh, let's say line, the black vertical line, and we have three instances that are above the threshold and apparently five below the threshold. What is the algorithm seeing? The algorithm only sees the upper and the lower bound, right? So the outcome of the algorithm of the MDP model checking is inconclusive because we cannot decide whether the family is below, beyond, below the or above the threshold. So what do we have to do? We have to refine. So we refine our family. Maybe we refine it in two parts. And suppose now that in this part, indeed, all the members, the four members are below the threshold. So what do we get by model checking the Markov decision process of the quotient? We get the picture on the right. It tells you both the upper bound and the lower bound are below the threshold. So there is no uh, family member that is having a value uh, above the threshold. So we can conclude that all these family members do not satisfy our property. So we rule them out. 
And now you check the remaining four. Suppose this is the situation for the upper four. And what you see, three members are above, but one is below the threshold. So again, the conclusion of the Markov decision process model checking is inconclusive. So what do we have to do? We have to split. So maybe we split like this. Um, and now suppose that now all three members are above the threshold. That means, uh, well, I mean, below and above. So also that is inconclusive. So we have to refine again until in the end we get, in this example, two family members that satisfy the property. Um, is this procedure clear? Is the idea of the procedure clear? I think so. We can see whether there are any questions from the audience. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions. So perhaps we can continue. Okay, good. Um, so this is uh, has a huge panel, a huge potential. Um, um, the, there also is drawbacks. I mean, it's not a silver bullet because the quotient itself may be much larger than any family member. Um, but this works for some examples, and I will show you some examples later on which this uh, is, is going to work. So another approach that people looked at is uh, counterexample guided inductive synthesis, and I consider this as a bottom-up procedure. So let me explain uh, the idea of this procedure. We have to go back. And this is depicted in the picture here. The picture is a bit simpler uh, for the cigar. There is no abstraction. So we start with a family on the left top. So think about this left box there as being a representation of all the family. So all the family members are Markov chains. So now I take one Markov chain, which is the black dot in this rectangle, which is a Markov chain. And now I discharge this to my probabilistic model checker, the verifier, the yellow box. If the yellow box says your Markov chain satisfies the property, I'm happy and I found a feasible realization. If, however, uh, the property is rejected, it gives back a counterexample, a conflict. And based on this conf conflict information, we hope that we can not only decide and conclude that the instance of the Markov chain, the black dot that we have selected, violates the property, but maybe many more. And that's the dashed area in the thing. So by means of using the counterexample information from the model checker, the idea is that to prune the number of family members, yeah, more rapidly than, than doing this one by one. Of course, if this family in the end is empty or the, all, the all the realizations have been ruled out, then the problem unfortunately is unsatisfiable. But otherwise, at some point, I will find a feasible realization. So if I use my 25 example before, the five times five, uh, this is depicted in the, in the grids uh, below. So if you see on the left, uh, the left bottom, there we instantiate one Markov chain, the, the purple one in the in basically at the origin. Suppose this one is violating. So my model checker says, no, 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 no. This instance is not satisfying my property. And now the conflict information of the verifier allows me to rule out all the candidates in the first column. And now I pick another instance. So for instance, I take you know, the second picture. I pick the next one, which is the purple one. Same principle, model checker says, this is not a good instance. I use the, my conflict, my counterexample information. And by doing this, uh, I rule out the entire column. And this continues until in the end, I found try to find one feasible realization. And that's depicted on the picture on the right, where you see one green instance, which indeed is one realization satisfying the property. So one word about these counterexamples, because they are important. So what is a counterexample? Now, suppose I represent my family in terms of a prism program with some variables. Then a counterexample is a minimal subset of that program. So it's the kind of the smallest fragment, if you want, of the program that already suffices to show that my property is violated. Okay, so you want to reach a certain set of states with let's say probability larger than a half, this is violated. And now your model checker gives you a counterexample, which is a submodel represented as a prism program. And that submodel already violates your property. And finding the minimal, uh, the minimal uh, command set is actually hard. It's actually an NP complete problem. So 
what you try to do is you try to uh, either do a greedy approach or you use some kind of maxat approach. So maximal satisfiability type of thing. And to give you an idea about these counter examples, here I have some numbers where you see uh, different Markov chains, the model, the left column, and the number of states, the third column, and the number of transitions. So here is the, uh, the number of transitions seem to be the crucial factor to compute actually those counter examples. And actually, uh, if you compute those counter examples, and those are the two rightmost columns, um, the real counter example, uh, let's say, can be quite small, like for instance, eight, if you look at the very first row. Um, but the counter example that you can compute is, for instance, a bit larger. Yeah, because at some point, the computation, you stop. Uh, you don't want to in invest exponential amount of time. You stop the computation once you found a counter example that is small enough. And why is the size of a counter example important? Well, that's because of the following property. If you have a sub Markov chain of the Markov chain that satisfies a property, then the whole Markov chain violates that property too. So if your sub Markov chain, a sub program already is enough to show that the probability to reach a set of states is larger than a half, yeah, then of course the larger Markov chain also uh, refutes this. And what? why is this now important in this uh, synthesis problem? Now, if this sub Markov chain is small, it means that all family members that share, that have this sub Markov chain in common, can also not satisfy the property. So they also will violate the property. So if I'm lucky in my search procedure, to find one family member refuting the property, then if the counterexample gives me so much information that I can rule out many family members in one shot, and that's very effective and turns out to be very effective. Um, and actually you can combine the two. I won't go into the details here. So on the left, the green box is actually this uh, counterexample guided abstraction refinement. So there you use abstractions. Um, on the right, the light blue one is indeed the counterexample guided inductive synthesis oracle. And actually, you can combine the two by saying, in some cases, it's more profitable to use a Seegers approach. In other cases, it's more profitable to use a Seegar approach. And actually, you can combine uh, both of them uh, in a case. And this has been implemented in, uh, in, in Python using uh, 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 SMT Solver Z3 and uh, a probabilistic model checker uh, storm. So we did this ex in experimentation and I will show you uh, what you get and for several types of, uh, of, uh, of applications. So you take uh, as input a, a, a PRISM file or a file in a, an intermediate format called JANI and it has open integer constants. So it has simply constants K and L. They're not defined. You simply say the, the K can be one, two, three, four, five, up to 10 and the same for M, but you don't fix the value of those constants, right? That's what I call open. And we use STORM um, because, uh, yeah, uh, in uh, recent co competitions uh, in TACAS 2019 and ISOLA 2020, it turned out that actually uh, the number of instances that you can solve uh, in the amount of time is quite profitable. So if you compare here, for instance, the red curve, the STORM curve to, to uh, let's say the, the green curve, which is the curve for PRISM, and mind that the y scale is log scale, the y axis is uh, is log scale. It means that uh, yeah, Storm is able to solve, let's say, standard Markov chains and MDPs simply faster than uh, than Prism can do. So that's the model checker we use, and we use this kind of principle of synthesis on top of it. And I want to show you this by means of concrete examples. What you can now do with this. Um, so here I have an example, which is about a dynamic power manager. Manager. So the idea is that the jobs arrive on the left. You have high priority jobs. You have low priority jobs. The jobs are queued in queues. And um, you have a system, a service provider that can be in several modes. So in this example, um, inspired by a paper by Benini, the system, the service provider has four modes. It can be busy. It can be idle. It can be standby. It can be sleeping. And based on the mode, it, it consumes a certain amount of energy. And if you want to switch from one mode to another mode, I mean, certain switches are basically for free between idle and busy, but uh, between uh, sleep and uh, I think there's one arrow that should be the other way around between sleep and idle, 
it will cost you a bit. And if you switch from idle to sleep, it all will also cost you a bit. This you can model in, in Prism. So here you see a snippet, a snippet of the Prism code. So here you see those two constants, H and K. Those are the ones that actually describe the different topologies that you can map in your family. And you see this, for instance, in the very in the third line of the module that says that if my current S value is zero, then with probability one, my next state S prime will be H. But H is, let's say, not um, defined upfront, right? So that's a non-deterministic choice between all possible values of H. And you see the same on the one bot last line. If my state is seven, then with point eight, my next state will be K. And with point two, my next state will be two. Yeah. So also now, depending on K, you have uh, finitely many choices there. So in total, uh, the challenge here is to synthesize actually the guards and the updates in the control program. So this you can write down as a, as a control program and it had uh, uh, a couple of holes. And actually the family size, um, if in the case that we have 16 parameters, um, the number of different instances, so the number of family members, so the number of concrete Markov chains is uh, 43 million. Now each Markov chain itself is not very big. It's about in on average 3.6 thousands of states. If you do the baseline, so if you would model check naively all 33 million uh, programs, uh, then it will take you uh, more than a month. But if you, and in this case, the Seeger approach turns out to be working quite well, you solve this in nine hours. So this sounds a lot, nine hours. But I like to stress that basically what we do is you start with a program that has certain gaps. It has certain holes, right? And now what you try to synthesize automatically, what are the correct, let's say, sub substitutions for those holes such that the final program satisfies your specification, right? So you automatically synthesize the possible, let's say, solutions to your to your problem. Here is um, uh, an example from uh, from software product lines. Um, what what does this has to do with software product lines? Right, this might be a bit far fetched. Uh, you can see the fel the family members as having instances of let's say products with different features. Yeah. So in a sense, those families are representations either syntactically or at, let's say, a state-based level of different, let's say, uh, products of different instantiations, I mean, models with different features. Yeah. So we apply this to, a, to a, a small example. It's a body sensor network. So here is an example of such a, such a body sensor network. It's, um, it's a configuration we took from this uh, Hayes paper by Rodriguez and co-authors. Uh, so this was a configuration that had 10 binary features. So basically 10 options, right? And every option has two possibilities. So the specification was a, a certain level of reliability. So again, something like a reachability probability. And this was at least at those days when we did this two years ago, the largest probabilistic SPL benchmark that we had in our, uh, at our disposal. If you have other ones that are, uh, let's say, larger or more challenging, then we would be more than happy uh, to be informed about this. So what's the family size here? It's uh, about 1,000 products, right? Because we have only those 10 binary features. The size of the model is very small, uh, 160 states. And actually here we represented this as this quotient. So here the quotient, so the representation as a family, as an MDP is, is larger, it's 300, more than 300 states. And you can actually even use enumeration or even this all-in-one approach that I, I, I presented very much in the beginning and this can solve all within seconds. So this is not at least a very challenging, uh, let's say, uh, case to, let's say, see where are the borders of, the, of this kind of technique. So the last example I want to show you is a maze. So you think about, uh, about a maze, and, and now what you would like to do, you would like to exit the maze. So here this example is by given by a mouse. And now the most important thing is here that this mouse wants to exit the maze, it moves, it makes the moves probabilistically. For instance, it decides to go up, to go to go north or to go south or to go east and go west, if that's possible, with a certain probability. But the point here is it's partial observ observable, right? Because there are certain yeah, areas in my maze where the mouse can't, can't distinguish between being, for instance, um, 
in the uppermost part of my maze or are somewhere down because it, it, its perspective is, is the same for both of it. So actually, this is what they call a partially observable uh, Markov decision process. And it's those kind of maze puzzles are quite well known in, in people that, that uh, in, in areas like, like planning. So to find uh, an optimal strategy, so if you are interested in what's the optimal strategy um, in the sense that what is the, the strategy that maximizes my probability to leave the, the maze, this turns out to be undecidable. Why is this? Um, this comes from the fact that you only have partial observability. So the way to think about this is um, think about a model. You have millions of states, but now you only can observe the colors of the state. So all states are colored, and you can only see that you are in a yellow state or in a red state, but you don't know in which yellow state you are. And now you have to resolve the non-determinism, but the amount of information that you have is basically not sufficient uh, to solve this. So you need actually infinite memory, and that actually uh, makes the problem undecidable. So then you may ask yourself, maybe we can simplify the problem. Can we maybe find the optimal positional strategy? So the strategy that doesn't use any memory, it only looks at the current color. So maybe I'm in a yellow state. And based on that information, it tries to make a decision to go north, to go south, to go east, or to go west. Well, that's also not an easy problem. And that's a problem which is uh, what is known to be ETR complete. I won't go into the details, but the picture on the left hopefully says there's a bit. ETR is a complexity class that lies between P space and NP. Yeah, so it's NP is in strictly included in ETR, and ETR is included in P space. That's the way to view it. And the way to remember this, uh, what kind of problems are ETR complete? If I give you a polynomial and you want to know what are the real roots, that's a problem which, for instance, is ETR complete. Or if I give you two polynomials and you want to know, do they share some roots? That's also a problem, which is ETR complete. Um, so the practice in, in practice in order to solve these uh, so to solve these kind of maze problems uh, that I showed you by the mouse is actually that people try to find what they call randomized uh, memoryless or finite state controllers with bounded memory. So you either the memory is one, you only use the current state, or it's something like two, where you can view the current state at least the color of the current state plus the color of your previous state, and then you make a decision. So here is such a maze in an abstract way. So here you would like to exit this maze and equally colored positions. So for instance, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are positions that you cannot distinguish. So if the robot is at position 10, it cannot distinguish this from position five, right? And now what you want to do is you want to have a policy, so a strategy that's going to exit this maze. So you would like to have the minimal amount of yeah, moves, the minimal amount of steps of the robot that exit this maze. And then what you can do, you can try to find a policy. And if you look carefully at my model, if you look at uh, all uh, purple colored states, five, six, seven, up to 10, and you look at the arrows, they're all labeled the same. So if from five, if I go to zero, then what you see, basically it does so if in five, there is a memory bit, which is zero. If the memory bit is zero, then it goes from five to the state zero, the red zero. And it does this by writing a zero to the memory. So the two zeros adjacent to the arrow, you should read one of them as you read a value. And the other one is the new value. And if you look carefully for all the states, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, the policy is the same. And it has to be because we can't distinguish between them. Right. So the puzzle here is, can we minimize the expected number of steps to exit the maze? So you can model this as a problem with uh, 22 parameters. There are about uh, nine and a half million possible strategies to, to solve this. And the Markov chain itself is relatively simple. That's 200 states. So in terms of my family, I have a family with about nine and a half million family members. Each Markov chain itself is small. Yeah, on average, 200 states. Um, and I want to find what's the optimal one. Yeah. So the baseline takes about two days. And you can solve this using a combination of this Seeger and Seeger's approaches by, by solving this in one hour. So in one hour, actually, the strategy, which is included in my picture on the left, is bit one and zero, and all the edges uh, between the different, let's say, positions in the maze are automatically synthesized in, in one hour. 
good. Now you can do the same for randomized self-stabilization. So that's the algorithm I started with. Can you do even better? Yeah, you can do better if you add memory. In the Hermann's protocol, we don't have memory. You just flip the coin again and you use the same bias. Yeah? But now you can actually include also a single bit of memory and you can even choose between different coin biases and that you can model again as an instance in the same framework. So there's seven parameters, 3.1 million family members, and the size of a Markov chain is about 1,000. And um, it, this you can solve in, in 70 minutes. So in 70 minutes, we can even improve on the uh, optimal bias that we synthesized by means of parameter size, uh, parameter synthesis before. Good. Um, so here is my, my concluding slides. Uh, my concluding slide, sorry. Um, there are many applications, at least we believe that there are many applications of this uh, uh, synthesis of uh, probabilistic models or programs. One is the program sketching. That was my dynamic power control manager, where you start with a prism model, but there are simply some gaps, some unknown aspects of your program, and that's what you automatically can synthesize. Um, I showed you this controller synthesis in partially observable systems. This was my mouse in, in a maze. Um, I think there is also a, quite a potential to apply this to, uh, to reliability uh, and quantitative properties in, in software product lines. And I gave you an example in, in randomized distributed computing. I already started with saying that this is, to my opinion, work that is still in quite an initial phase in the sense that we, I mean, and, and not only we, also other groups spent about two, three years on this. Um, of course, the question is what happens to families of MDPs? I only showed you the families of Markov chains. Um, what happens if the families are not finite, but they're infinite? Um, what happens if my family members are not finite, but they could be infinite and so forth? So there are many questions that you can pose. Um, if you're interested in this, um, uh, I think most details, I, I would advise you to, to look at the, our recent paper at CAF 2021, because there we presented uh, actually a tool that supports all this. Um, if you're more interested in the underlying theoretical, let's say, foundations of it, um, I would advise you to first lo look at this uh, Festschrift of Scott Smolka, where I think there's a very accessible, at least I hope it's an accessible account um, of this, uh, these kind of approaches. And the more technical effects are, um, are given in the Takas and the FM paper. If you're interested in experimentation, you can use the, the tool paint. And um, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh... Yours, Peter, it was a very uh, accessible and, and also a uh, very informative talk. Uh, our time is up, but I think it would be a shame if we don't ask a few questions. So are there any questions in the audience? Does anyone want to ask a question? Please unmute yourself or raise your hand, whichever you prefer. Raiko, please. Can I raise my real hand? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Um, <laughs> So I, I was just wondering, um, would it help if you have a higher level model as an input, uh, like a, like a Petri net, a stochastic Petri net or something like that, rather than working on the on the Markov chain, because we can probably inherit some structure from that. Yeah. Um, so in, in fact, I explain everything in terms of the model. We we actually describe these model uh, these models in in a syntax, and we use their uh, the prism language. Uh, and what we do actually is, for instance. If we generate counterexample, we do this at the prism level. We don't do this at the model level. We try to exploit the structure. And definitely, if you use a different high-level description of your language, like a state chart or a Petronet or a process algebra, absolutely, you need to be uh, uh, to use the structure of your of your model there explicitly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? So maybe. I can ask one until another question arrives. So, so you mentioned you are not uh, yet doing MDPs. Uh, what came to my mind when you were describing this in the context of software product lines is that not all valid, no, not all ranges of parameters are valid in software product lines. Typically, there are dependencies. If you if you select one, then you are deselecting another. Now, have you thought about that problem? Is that related to the MDP problem or? Um, 
I think you can encode these dependencies, at least if you if you make these explicit, if you say, let's say, for instance, if you say that if H equals five, then K needs to be in that range, you can explicitly add this as constraint to your prison program. So that's possible. Um, so we allow this in 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 the in the prism uh, in the extension of the prism uh, dialect that we use basically. Um, so that we can do with with Markov chains. Um, but if you really would like to have non-determinism, this is something that we currently are not able to handle. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Maybe I could ask one more. If there are no. So you, you were mentioning that the, you, you, you can choose between uh, CIGAR and CIGIS. Um, is there a heuristic that you use to switch between yeah. the two? Can we run them in parallel perhaps and see which one terminates sooner? Oh or? yeah, you could do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, the scheme I was using, um, so basically, to be honest, we started first, the, our first paper was on CIGAR. Mm -hmm. Then we thought, let's investigate CIGIS. Um, and we saw basically that on some examples, CIGIS was uh, uh, much way better than CIGAR and vice versa. So um, what we try to do is then try to marry them in some sense. And marry them is not running them in parallel. What you see in this diagram, I didn't go into the details, but really also that you use some information from, let's say, from one, if you do a, a few steps of CIGAR, you use the information that you obtain there to steer the next steps if you then would do CIGIS. Yeah? But of course, you could run them in parallel and then try to get uh, to see which one finishes first and is able to 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 handle the problem first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, and the steering yeah. in the in the in the yellow box is indeed done by a heuristic. Yeah. Right. Are there any other questions? Let's wait for a couple of seconds. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you very much again, uh, Jos Peter. It was a very, very interesting talk. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, we hope we can use these results uh, in the future. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for thanks. listening, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.